The ukulele as the instrument is known but not famous yet. But when have you started to play the ukulele and why? Well, whenever I give interviews for what I do musically, mostly I say to the people, well, my first instrument was viola. But when I look back, that wasn't actually true. My father came home one day with two ukuleles, one for me and one for my brother. And I was about seven or eight years old and within and within a couple of and within a couple of hours, I taught my brother to play "Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley," and then we have. Then that's how I started with the ukulele. We had one each. So, if somebody wants to play the ukulele, am I going to a guitar teacher, or how do I learn the, to play the ukulele? Um, well, I mean, I mean, I taught myself really, and, and I had a small book, and it showed you how the fingering goes. And I've got a ukulele here, strangely enough. And all you do, the, the, I mean, the, the tuning is like that. And all you have to do is one finger, and then you have it. It's that easy. And then you go from there, and you work other chords out. And you can get a book. You can buy books and stuff. And online, nowadays, with everything online and, and, and things like that, you can, you can go online, and you can find chord pages where you practice chords. You can download stuff and print stuff out for yourself. It's not difficult. Well, the ukulele is much smaller than a common guitar. So I would say it's rather for kids or for people with small hands, isn't it? And your hands are big. Yes, well, my hands are relatively big. I'm a relatively big person, so obviously my hands are big. But on the other side, um, uh, I think that anybody can play it. I mean, you could, you could actually say the same thing about a piccolo or a flute in the end. That's a very small instrument, you know, but, but in the end, anybody can play it. And I think that that's the attraction of the ukulele. And you can put it in a backpack. You can put it in, in, not exactly in your pocket, but you can hold it and it's, it's very easy to transport. And they don't make you book another seat on an aircraft for it. How did you get the idea of producing a ukulele show? Well, it was, it was a strange thing. We were on a bus tour at one point and, um, and I had the ukulele to, uh, with me, which I normally do anyway, because as I said, it goes into the luggage very easily. And I was just bored and started strumming and I was strumming away on Omi or Babino Carol or something. And uh, several other people on the bus said, ah, oh, that's a good idea. They got ukuleles out and we all started playing. Everybody was laughing so much that in the end, the bus driver had to pull over into, the, into um, a side turning because everybody was laughing so much and having such a good time that we all thought, what is this? We've, we've got something something here. And it's one of those strange things with the ukulele. You start playing, everybody joins in, everybody loves to join in, and they all start smiling. It's such a great feeling type of instrument when everybody plays together. And I think that that's very, very important. What is your relationship to the legendary Monty Python group? Well, the relationship is, is, is that the Bonzo Dog Duda Band were formed in the 60s. And uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the comedy stuff that was going on at the BBC at the time encompassed a lot of people from Cambridge, from the art schools in the 60s and the late 60s and the early 70s. And through that whole thing came a very, very important children's show called Do Not Adjust Your Set. And on that children's program, a lot of the people who then went on to become Monty Python, i.e. John Cleese, Eric Idle, um, all these type of people, they were on this show with the Bonzo Dog Band as the house orchestra, if you like. And because I was Vivian Stanchel's MD from the end of the Bonzos till, the, till his death, therefore I know a lot of these people, and through working so much as I have with the BBC over the years, you meet these people and we all come together and do things, and that's how that whole sort of connection came. So that means the musicians also bring in their ideas, or is it all based on your personal creativity? No, the situation is that I put the whole orchestra together, I put the whole script together, I put all the music together, so it is my show. But I know that how these things go, it cannot stay as my show. Then it's not going to live, it's not going to develop. Therefore, the reason I, I tried to build the orchestra from such great characters, and we have great characters, is because they take the platform that I built, and then they build on it individually. And that has become so good and so clear in the last tour, how they have built on their own characters. And that comes through, and that is very, very important, because I don't want it to be about me. I want it to be about the group ensemble together, because that is what will make it bigger and better. What makes the show so successful? Is it the humor? Is it the music? Is it the musicians? Is it the instrument? What exactly is it? I think it's a combination of everything. I think if you just had the music, the songs, that would be fine. But then people sit there and after half an hour they think, oh yeah, this is very nice, but you know, so what? And if you just had the humor without the musical excellence, 
that then is a little bit, and this is why I've tried to build the show so that we have really good musical moments. So that you can, they can really play absolute serious stuff. And then the next minute, it's madness, mayhem, and silliness. And that is what is the secret of real comedy. All comedy is like eating chocolate all day long. You get tired of it. So you have to intersperse it with clever stuff. And I think it's a sum of all the three things that you've said. For many years, you've been working for the BBC in London. What exactly did you do there? Well, I did a lot. Um, I started off with the BBC. Funny enough, I started off with a, a, a very famous comedy satirical um, uh, uh, radio show called The News Headlines. It was called The News Headlines and not The Headlines because the star was a man called Roy Hudd. And it had June Whitfield, who's in it, and, um, and another one called Chris Emmett. Now, this ran for 27 years. And, it's, and I started, I know what you're saying, what was a boy of three doing working for the BBC? But the point is that it ran so long, and we are in the Guinness Book of Records as the longest running satirical comedy sh uh, radio show ever. And through all that, I then worked in a lot of television in the 80s and 90s for the BBC, wrote a lot of theme tunes, um, uh, did a lot of uh, directing work for people like Dusty Springfield, Kiki D. Hazel O'Connor, Dana, people like that. So I did a lot of work for the BBC, freelance work, and worked with the, with the shows. And what was your radio show about? The radio show, as I said, it was called The News Headlines, and which meant it, it, it took the week's news, it took the, week, it took the week's news and made fun of it. And nobody was sacred, even dear Andrew Lloyd Webber, who I love dearly, but nobody was sacred. And so we have this whole situation where um, uh, we used to run right up until the last minute. And I always remember we, we used to write satirical stuff on the news, sketches, lots of music and things like that. And I always remember that the, 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 right up to the last minute, one week, there was a whole thing with the new airport screening and Diana Ross came through and she created a big fuss because somebody touched her. And so we had to create a song called Touch Me in the Airport. And that was the type of humor that it was. And it was, I found it wonderful because uh, we used to, I used to start working on it Wednesday afternoon with my producer talking to me, sending me stuff. I work all the night. We get in 10 o'clock into Brainwashing House. That's bro Broadcasting House, the normal people in the BBC. We start rehearsals at 10.30. We do the run through at 12. The audience comes in at quarter to one. The show goes one to two. It's edited in the afternoon and goes out at seven o'clock in the evening. And I love that type of immediacy. I love that type of spontaneity. And it was so fast, you have to be very quick. And on that show, um, our bass ukulele player, Dougie, worked with me for almost the whole time of that as well. So he is a very, that's why he's one of my oldest friends. So uh, that means that, you, that some of the musicians are old friends of you, it sounds like. So for how long do you know them? A lot of them are old friends of mine, yes, that's true. I mean, the one thing I wanted to do was to, was to build an orchestra par excellence. That, that means that in the end, I did not want a couple of strummers who play down the pub once a week. I didn't want that. I wanted really good musicians that can put a show on and, and play some of the things like we do, like Radetzky, William Tell Overture, and Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean, these are complicated things. Bohemian Rhapsody in its own right is as complicated as, as the William Tell Overture. Therefore, we needed good people. Therefore, I needed people I knew as musicians and could trust. Two of the people I did not know beforehand, but they have become so important to the group and so good in their own right. It's just like I've known them forever anyway. Is there any anecdote from the past you, you uh, like to remember and to tell us? Anecdote from the past? I, um, I've got... Uh, I've got so many anecdotes. Um, I think I think one of the one of the uh, one of the loveliest um, uh, anecdotes I can say is when um, Vivian and myself were working together, and all of a sudden he wanted something special to be played, and Vivian Stanshaw um, only played the ukulele, and he wrote all these songs on the ukulele, and suddenly from nowhere, and I don't know where he came, Eric Clapton turned up, and. Eric Clapton, the mo one of the most famous guitarists in the entire world history of music, then picked up the ukulele and started playing this song. And he's still got it. It's when, when cannibals choose cheese or something like this, a really silly song. And Eric Clapton is playing ukulele on it. So it just shows you anybody and everybody can play the ukulele and do it well. How long has that ago? Oh, that was 20 years, 25 years ago, I suppose. A long time ago, but it's wonderful. It's still around. I mean, people, I'm sure people can find it on the net somewhere. You also arrange classical pieces 
for example, Phantom of the Opera. What is the main difference between classical and uh, funny shows? And what is easier for you to do? For me, there is no difference. It's all important to be done properly and professionally. And I, and I think, like various people have said, myself, Bernstein, various other people have said, there's only two types of music in this world, and that's good and bad. And for me, the ukulele orchestra, in its own way, is just as important as the 12 tenors, Peter Hoffman, all these things, yeah. the Phantom of the Opera, it's all music, and it's all good music. What ideas do you have for following productions? Is your creative mind still working? Always. I mean, I think that we, we've, uh, we've done this year and it was so successful, I'm very, very happy. But that is not a thing that I like to see. I don't like to see that this is professional, this is perfect, this is really good, therefore it stays like it is. I don't believe it. I believe it always, the thing has to develop. So we bring in new fresh blood, new people here and there, new ideas come and things like that. And, and I'm always working on new ideas, new songs, new ideas for comedy, new ways to bring the show up more and more. I think the whole thing has to move, it has to live. The minute you stand still and say, I've done it, from that moment on it starts to die. And that's what I think. You and the musicians, you support a child charity in Israel. It's called um, Ukuleles for Peace. Correct. What is this project about? Well, I think it's a very, very important project and, and when uh, it was put to me by the management and I put it to the orchestra, they were totally 100% behind it because it is a, 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 it's, it's, um, based on a situation, an idea from a man called Paul Moore who um, lives in Israel and he works with his wife with Palestinian and Israeli children. He brings them together with ukuleles so that the Palestinian and the Israeli children play together and learn to know each other through music. No fear, no um, aggression, and that people in the world are people. And we support this very, very strongly because the way, I'm not just saying that the way to the future for peace is through music, but music is a great way of understanding somebody else. Music is universal. As we proved, we have English playing in Germany, they love it. So music is universal and if the Israeli and Palestinian kids can work together and create wonderful music with a small instrument like a ukulele, it shows a way for the rest of the world. So it means ukuleles bring nations together, right? I would say so, yes. I don't like to sound too precious about it, but I, I, I really do believe that. I really do believe that. It, it's, it's very, very important to break down barriers. You think there is more to come? Is, uh, what else can the ukulele reach? Well, I think, I think, um, I think uh, uh, if we could, one of the aims that I have, one of the things you were asking me earlier about ideas, I want to take the ukulele orchestra situation out of Europe and take it further. And I think we could, we could reach m other audiences. And we have a, a, a spot in the show where we get people up on the stage from the audience and we make them play a ukulele, even if they only play one or two chords and even if it's very bad. Afterwards, people come to us and say, that was such a wonderful experience, I'd like to do more. And if we can go to other places, countries, uh, that, that maybe have problems, I don't know, and we can get them interested, maybe we can sort of help that situation move just that little step further. Thank you, Peter, for the interview, and have a good luck and a lot of fun for further productions. Thank you very much. <laughs>